Uh, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Global Compliance Panel's uh, another live webinar. Uh, the topic for today's presentation will be Understanding Analytical Test Results Comparing Two Sets of Data. Um, I'm really honored uh, and a privilege to introduce to you uh, our speaker for today, uh, Dr. Stephen Hess Kuara. Originally from Hawaii, Dr. Kuara holds a degree holds degrees in biochemistry from Cornell and the, and the University of uh, Wisconsin. Um, he's the founder and the principal of GXP Biotechnology LLC, a consulting firm that works in the areas covered by GLP and GMP of drugs, biologics, and nutraceuticals. Uh, Steve has over 30 years of experience in supervising quality control laboratories, including an animal testing facility, and in performing GLP and GMP audits for internal and external testing laboratories. Steve has participated in the development of drugs and biologics through all phases of clinical research and the final production. Um, Dr. Kuara has written several uh, papers and book chapters and serves on the editorial advisory boards of Biofarm, Bioquality, and the Journal of GXP Compliance. He and a colleague have recently published translations of the Chinese GMPs and the in inspection checklist for the Chinese GMP certificates. He has held certifications as the CQA, CQT, and CQE from the American Society of Quality and was certified RAC by the Regulatory, Regulatory Affairs Professional Society. And Steve, we're really honored to have you with us today. Um, now, before we begin, I would like to inform you of the, of the program outline for the session. Um, as you may be aware, the session is 75 minutes duration. Uh, first, Steve will take you through today's presentation, highlighting the areas that would be covered, and he would then share with you his presentation. Uh, we would also like to inform all participants, uh, uh, once part of the teleconference, you have been placed on mute. Um, so if you'd like to ask your questions verbally, it, would be, it has to be during the Q&A session, the last 10 minutes. Um, uh, last minute, 10 minutes of the time will be dedicated for the Q&A. However, if you'd like to send in your chat message during the, ch uh, during the presentation, please feel free to send it to me, and I shall pass it on to Steve for an answer during the Q&A. Now, if for any reason you get logged out of the training session or the teleconference, uh, please feel free to follow the same procedure to join in again. I hope everyone is ready to start the session. I now request uh, uh, Steve to take it from here. Steve? Uh, thank you very much, David. Um, what we're going to talk about today is basically the, well, some people consider it very simple. However, it's not as simple as it appears uh, on the surface. The, the problem here is that uh, you, you run some assays, you do some tests, and uh, the number doesn't come out to be exactly what you expected it to be. So the question then becomes, is this number significantly different from the number you were expecting? Or you get into a situation where you have two sets of numbers and you have to ask yourself, are these significantly different from each other, or are they so close that it doesn't make any difference, and you can sort of assume that um, you know, the, the truth lies maybe in between. Now, the first thing I'm gonna show you here uh, is not meant to scare anybody, but basically it's to show you that yes, there is such a thing as the e equation for the bell-shaped curve or the normal distribution. And the thing I want you to notice in this equation is that there are two places here and here where we have sigma. This is the lowercase sigma and it re represents the standard deviation. Now there's another term up here. This xi can either be an individual number or it can be an average, in which case this mu here is the theoretical or the true average or the true number. The whole idea here in the normal distribution is that we are looking to see um, where other numbers fall in given that they, they have inherent error. So you wouldn't expect to get the true number all the time because of the inbuilt error into your measuring systems and your estimation systems. And as a result, you generate a so-called bell-shaped curve. Now, in the bell-shaped curve here, uh, we see it following the same thing. You might, for instance, run an assay and you get one result, say here. 
And then you run another assay and you get another result out here. Now, it turns out that each one of these determinations is really an estimate. It's an estimate of this mu, the true, true value. But we don't hit it because of error inherent in the system. And we now want to ask the question is that are these really both estimates of the same true value or are these really two different numbers? And well, first of all, characteristics of the normal distribution is that plus or minus one sigma, one standard deviation, it covers 68% of the area in here under the curve. The plus or minus two standard deviations, actually it's 1.96 standard deviations, but um, well, people sort of like to round it off to two. It makes it easier for people who can't work with decimals too well. Um, it covers 95% of the area under the curve. So that would be this area here. And for plus or minus three standard deviations, it's 99.7% of the area under the curve. And I want you to keep in the back of your mind the fact that there is a 0.3% that is outside of this. These are the little tails out here. And this is how your data should be distributed. If you're, estim if you're making estimates of the true value mu here, and all you're getting is variation due to random error, then the numbers, all of your estimates will follow this curve, and they will lie under the curve here. Now, the thing that happens is that well, we need, to, we need to consider a few other things. You remember the sigma that we talked about, the standard deviation? Well, here's a, here's a set of normal distributions, and they all have the same mu value, or the true value, or the true average. And then, depending upon the size of sigma, we have varying widths to it. Now, the thing about these curves that I'm showing you, all of them contain the same area under the curve. It's just that the widths differ. And you can see here, for instance, this peak here is on an average with a relatively small standard deviation. And then down here, we have curves, we have the same average but we have much larger standard deviations. So the numbers are distributed more widely. And this is where you get into problems because with a large standard deviation, you could, for instance, get a number out here and a number down here, and the difference appears to be so large that you may conclude that they're actually different numbers. And so when you compare the two sets of numbers, you think, well, they're different, and you know, you you conclude that there are um, they're not related, when in fact they are both estimates of the same value mu, and they're both equally good. But it's the big, the wide standard deviation, the large standard deviation creates the appearance that they are not equivalent. Now for a normal distribution, if the coefficient of variation, now the coefficient of variation is the standard deviation divided by the average that corresponds to that standard deviation. Uh, it's also known as the percent relative standard deviation. And if it's greater than about 33.3%, um, you're going to have trouble trying to maintain a normal distribution. And also, as we just saw in the previous slide, if the coefficient of variation is too large, in other words, the relative standard deviation is too large, the location of the average will be highly variable, and we'll see this better in an in a upcoming slide. 
But for those of you who need to test your data to see if they nor really are normally distributed, the preferred tests for normalcy um, have been published in the European Pharmacopoeia in Section 8, uh, Part 13. And it's also been published in a journal called Technometrics. Technometrics is published by the American Society for Quality and the American Statistical Association. And it's in Volume 10, page 825 in uh, 1968. Now, the other critical factor here is a thing called the variance. Now, I want to show you something here. This is kind of important to avoid confusion. I am showing this as S squared. The variance is the square of the standard deviation. And the convention that's used among statisticians and most other people is that if you show something as a Greek letter, the Greek letter denotes a theoretical or population value. A population value is technically, it's the number you would get if you had an infinitely large number of I, of readings or values or whatever. And um, don't, don't let that infinity scare you because infinity is actually a lot smaller than a lot of people think. But anyway, if you had this population value, then this would be sigma squared. But in this case, because we are going to be dealing with relatively small numbers, we are estimating the population value. And when we do that, we use regular Latin alphabet on um, values. So in this case, S squared is the variance. And you can see that we have um, several forms of this. Now, here's the original definition of the variance. The variance is the sum of the squares of the differences between the number you observe and the average of a set of numbers, of that corresponding set of numbers. And it's divided by n minus 1, which is really the degrees of freedom here, n being the number of replicates that were used to calculate this x up here. Now, <clears throat> the sum of the squares divided by n minus 1 gives you the variance the square root of this would give you the standard deviation. Now, there's two other equations I've shown here. There is this one up here on the top that is often seen in statistical calculations. Uh, this one is more easily uh, used in statistical calculations. It shows up fairly easily in them. And then this one on the bottom here is the form of the equation that is used in calculators and sometimes in computer programs, um, mainly because I am told that for a calculator or a computer program, it's easier to calculate these, this number than it is to calculate using this formula. So. The thing here is that if you, well, if you have nothing to do some afternoon, <laughs> uh, you can sit down and you can show that this definition here, this equation for the definition, can be transformed into either this equation or this equation here. So algebraically, they're all the same. And you don't worry about, you know, the, um, the fact that they look different. They're really all the same number. The range of a set of numbers, this is the, the largest number minus the smallest number. This would be the range. If this is divided by a number called D2, you will then get the standard deviation for situations where the number, the number of replicates that you have are smaller than 16. Now, D2 here. Um, you know, it sounds like a mysterious number and anything. 